to be in a Highlands College Chapel service. Man, this is the highlight of my week, getting to see all of you in the same room together. Um, we love you guys. The Pettis family loves you. I had two of my kids wake up super early this morning to go to a Bible study at their school that you guys lead. Come on. And I'm grateful. Um, the school is changing because of you. I also want you to know um, that we had a guest in here in chapel on Tuesday who used to oversee the SEU services, um, their chapel services. And he said, Jill, what you guys have here is really special. And I said, I know, but can you tell me what you see? He said, your students are leaned in. They're hungry. They come expectant. And so thank you. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for leaning in. We love you guys. Um, I know it's already been done, but I want to welcome the Discovery Day guests. It is so great to have you with us. We are so grateful that you took time to come and check out Highlands College, and we've been praying for you that if this is where you're supposed to be, that God would speak to you and you would be able to hear him. And we just appreciate all of you so much. We've got some other guests in the room. We've got some impact guests with us today. Yes. Highlands College would not be what it is without each of you. We've got um, alumni, Russ Daly is in the room today. Uh, graduated in 2013, is now a campus pastor at Red Rocks Church. So glad to have you joining us. And we also, anybody ready for the women's conference this weekend? Not anybody, just the girls, just the girls. Let me make that clear. But we have Pastor Julie Mullins that's with us today as well. It's an honor to have you with us. <laughs> All right, I need to know, is anybody ready to dig into God's Word? That's right, that's right. Well, I get the honor and privilege of introducing our speaker today. She says that she is first a wife and a mom of three incredible boys. Now you know why I love her so much. I'm like, tell me all the wisdom. Um, and not only is she an author, she's an actor and an incredible speaker. But I want y'all to grab a hold of how much she loves and dives into the Word of God today. You know, one of our learn student learning objectives for you guys is that you would have the authority of Scripture. I want y'all to pick up on that today from Miss Priscilla's life and the way that she communicates. And I'm so excited. Y'all get your notes ready. We're all going to leave knowing God better today because of how she communicates the Word. So y'all stand on your feet and help me welcome Miss Priscilla Shire. Well, good morning. It's so great to be with you, family. You may take your seats. I'm so thrilled about the privilege to be able to talk to my young brothers and sisters about the things of God. I believe in the power of the Word of God to transform our lives, to change us. I recognize now in hindsight, and I'm going to tell you this and I'm going to pray. In hindsight, I recognize that some of the most trajectory-shifting things that the Lord did was when I was exactly your age. You don't know it in the moment. You're just going through the rhythm of what it is that the Lord has assigned to you and the people that you're interacting with and the routine of going to the class or studying or preparing or doing whatever it is that you're doing. And you don't know until hindsight that this is it right here. So I'm telling you, if I could go back, I would be milking every moment of this season for everything God has for you. Nothing is chance, nothing is happenstance, all of this is setting you up for what God has for you in the future. Lord Jesus, I thank you that this moment in time has been ordained before the foundation of the world. 
that there is not one person under the sound of my voice who you did not intend to speak to today. So I pray that you would shake all of our hearts awake from any spiritual slumber that they may be in and that you would open up our spiritual ears to hear your voice. Lord, don't let any of us leave this place without knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt that we have heard the voice of God. Speak, Lord. We're your sons and daughters, and we're listening. In Jesus' name I pray. Everybody say amen. 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 Thank you. Y'all, I have three siblings. My oldest uh, sibling is my sister, Crystal. Crystal was the first grandchild on both sides of the family. So for my dad's parents, mom's parents, this first grandbaby was, and I hear from people that have grandchildren, they love them all, but it's that first one that does something for them. So, you know, she was born and they named her Crystal because she was the light of everybody's eyes and all that stuff. So Crystal's the older sister. My grandparents, on my dad's side, they lived not in the same city as us, so they didn't get to see us all the time. From Baltimore, Maryland, to where we were in Dallas, Texas, they would send cards to us and little gifts to us in the mail. And I remember around Christmas time, every single year, a big old box would come in the mail. It would have Crystal's name on it. And I remember that we together would stand there with mom as we opened up the box, and we would pull out all this stuff that two mama and two daddy, that's what we called them, two mama and two daddy sent really for us, but it was for Crystal. I knew what they were thinking. They were thinking that if they sent it in crystal size, that all other grandkids could just roll into those clothes eventually. So they would send a box of all the stuff little girls used to wear back in the day. I'm not talking about Baby Gap Old Navy stuff. Mm -mm. This was hoop skirts with lace on the bottom of the skirts and fold over socks and patent leather shoes and that sort of stuff. And we would pull it out of the box and I would stand there knowing it was too big for me. It was crystal size. But I would stand there completely mesmerized and excited because I knew that my sister would soon be growing out of all that stuff and it would all be mine but I do remember there was one year I don't know if it was because I was just a little bit older or something where that box came in the mail it had Crystal's name on it and I remember that particular year standing there watching the box be opened like we did every year but that year I had an attitude problem because I remember on that particular year you're watching this stuff come out of the box in crystal size and thinking you know what, I think I'm about done with this, this secondhand situation. I think I actually want a box to come in the mail that has my name on it. One that has been handpicked just for me. There's nothing wrong with hand-me-downs, but there should come a time in our life where we grow up just enough where we appreciate the hand-me-downs, but we would prefer something personal. I want to make sure you know that it would be an injustice to you to spend the entirety or me to spend the entirety of our Christian lives being spoon-fed hand-me-down revelation. That it is a joy and it is a privilege to have pastors and leaders and shepherds and teachers who write to us and who teach us and who help us to rightly divide the word of truth. But we will always be handicapped in our faith if we are constantly waiting on regurgitated truth from somebody else. There has to be a time where you mature enough, where you appreciate it, but it actually causes a little bit of dissatisfaction because there's got to be a point where you decide the same God who spoke to them is the same God I'm hungry to speak to me. And you can know that God does speak, that he speaks to each and every one of us. That he knows us. He knows where you are. He knows where I am. And it would be the work of the enemy in your heart and in mine to try to convince us that we have to be somebody else other than who we are to actually hear the voice of God. That if we don't have that degree, that if we haven't gone to that church, that if we aren't in that denomination, that if we haven't walked this particular path and if we don't have this particular background, that we also can't have the joy and privilege of hearing the voice of God. Because then we'll be handicapped at best in our relationship with him, in our walk with him, constantly waiting to be spoon-fed, hand-me-down revelation. So I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters, around the idea that you can hear the voice of God.
And the reason why I was sitting in the back, y'all, and I was thinking about what it was that I wanted to speak to you about today. And the reason why I landed on this topic is because I was thinking about how you have been in particular called to rise up in this generation with the spirit of Elijah to be the prophetic voice of truth piercing through all the lies in our culture. That, that people who fear for the folks who are your age growing up in such a godless time where y'all, the moral decline is at a rapid pace right now. I don't know if you've noticed. But to really serve God, to really stand up for truth, to really decide you ain't playing no games, that you're going to believe that there is still one true God and his name is Jesus Christ, and that he actually has a standard of truth that doesn't adjust to placate people's emotions. If you decide you're going to be that kind of person, you're going stick to like, stick out like a sore thumb. You're going to have to have backbone for that. That's what Elijah had. Elijah heard the word of God and then in the midst of a godless culture, he came and said, let me tell you what the one true and living God says. He didn't care whether it was politically correct. He didn't care wh whether people stood with him while he said it. He knew that he was the mouthpiece of God and in order to speak for God, you got to be able to hear from God. So I want to encourage you about hearing and discerning the voice of God. If there is one spiritual discipline that I wished I had honed a little bit more seriously earlier in my life, it would have been the privilege and the practice of hearing and discerning God. It's a lifetime pursuit. You'll never be perfect at it. It's something that we grow at from day to day, season to season, year to year. One of the clearest places in scripture where Jesus himself speaks about this privilege that you and I have to hear the voice of the one true and living God is in John chapter 10. In John chapter 10, I'm going to read to you verse 1 through 5 real quick, and then I'm just going to jump to verse 27 and sit there for just a few moments with you. John chapter 10, Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, that he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he's a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the doorkeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. Sounds like freedom to me. When he puts forth all his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him because, oh, listen to this. They know his voice. The stranger, they simply will not follow. They'll flee from him because they don't know the voice of the stranger. Verse 27. Here's the one-liner that if you still actually use a Bible with paper pages, y'all, this right here deserves to be underlined. Verse 27. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. In this one-liner, Jesus packs in this principle, this privilege, this discipline of discerning and hearing the voice of God. My sheep, what they do is they hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. Come with me for just a few moments and let's take a little journey. Because, you know, Jesus would talk about stuff that oftentimes in our modern day and age, we can't really put a picture around and completely understand because we don't deal with, you know, stuff like wheat and soil and grapes like that. So he'll tell stories about stuff that if we don't put ourselves back in the first century around the context in which he was speaking these words, we can't fully grasp what he was saying. So for just a few moments, I want you to journey with me to the Middle Eastern sheepfold in the first century time frame when Jesus would have spoken these truths. He's talking about shepherds and their sheep. In Jesus' time frame, when a shepherd was leading a flock, there could be 100 sheep, let's say, following behind one shepherd. And during the day when a shepherd was leading his flock around to green pastures and to still refreshing waters, he wouldn't be by himself. There would be about nine other shepherds that would also be leading their flock of 100 with that shepherd at the same time. So you've got 10 shepherd, let's, two shepherds, let's say, and about 1,000 sheep that are in and around the same vicinity all day long, meandering around to different pastures. And then in the evening... All 10 would take all of their flocks to one sheepfold for the night. 
The Middle Eastern sheepfold was a fenced off, a huge enclosed area that was a stone fence line that was about waist high. And in this huge enclosure, there would only be one opening, and the opening did not have a door. All ten of the shepherds would bring their flocks so 1,000 sheep are in the fold. Nine of the ten shepherds would go into the city so that they could sleep for the night, but one would stay behind. And listen to me, he would lay his body across the door, across the opening of the sheepfold, and he would become the door for the fold. His actual person, his body was there to lay across the opening of the sheepfold and protect to make sure there was no stranger, no predator that was coming to take advantage of the sheep inside this fold. And in the morning, when a shepherd would come back from the city so that he could retrieve his sheep, the porter, the doorkeeper, would stand up, look into the distance as the shepherd was coming to make sure he recognized this shepherd as one of the true shepherds of one of these flocks inside. And not until he authenticated that this was a true shepherd would he remove his body from the opening of the sheepfold and let this shepherd pass through. And then listen. The shepherd would come into the sheepfold and he would call his sheep. 1,000 would physically hear the call, but only 100 would recognize the call as having come from the voice of their shepherd. What mattered was not whether or not they were black sheep or white sheep. It didn't matter whether they congregated with a lot of sheep or just a little bit of sheep. It didn't matter whether they were on the south side of the sheepfold or the north side of the sheepfold. All that mattered was whether or not they belonged to the shepherd. Jesus says, my sheep are the ones who hear my voice. The very first thing he points out in verse 27 is the relationship. He says, you want to make sure that you can discern my voice throughout your lifetime, not just in one season and not just in the next, not just in up times, not just in down times, but throughout the entire trajectory of your relationship with me as your shepherd. You want to make sure that you can discern my leading in your life, then you better make sure we have a relationship with each other. You better make sure that you are actually mine. And so here I am at this Bible college to ask you a question. Have you made a decision to be in relationship with Jesus? Because you can study the Bible, memorize the Bible. You can be born in the church, grow up in church. They can bring your meals and feed you in the church. They can bring you a desk and let you work in the church. But if you die in the church and you have not placed personal faith in Jesus Christ, you will have not had your own relationship. God does not have grandchildren. It means that it don't matter what your mama and them did. It doesn't matter the faith of your grandmother or your grandfather. I'm so grateful for the legacy of faith that the Lord has given me in my own family. But I I learned early on that their faith wasn't going to supplant the fact that I was going to have to make my own decision to place faith in Jesus Christ. To make sure that I had my own thing going on with Jesus. So Jesus says, would you make sure, if you want to hear my voice, if you want to know my leading, if you want to know what it is to be able to discern the conviction of the Holy Spirit, then you need to make sure, first of all, you have a relationship with him. So (laughs) when I was growing up, (laughs) I grew up with, you know, the 80s and 90s Christian parents. These were the most Christian of all Christian parents. Which means we didn't watch a whole lot of TV growing up. There was a whole lot of, uh, you know, kind of strict rules and regulations. And the only time we really had the freedom to watch some TV during the week, it was also because, you know, you got stuff to do during the week when you're growing up. You got homework and there's dinner dishes and we had stuff to do. So they didn't want it to be distracted by TV. We didn't have cable or anything like that. We didn't have direct TV, none of that, because they didn't want us to waste time on all that, all that stuff during the week. We had things to do except on Thursday at 7 p.m. Because on Thursdays at 7 p.m., the Cosby Show came on. 
And then at 7.30 p.m., a different world came on. Please tell me y'all know about a different world. Come on, if you don't know about it, you need to go bless yourself and start at season one and just watch the entire thing. We would watch from 7 to 8 p.m. those two shows as a family. We would sit there and enjoy it. I remember that after um, I moved out of the house, I went to University of Houston, and then I was a graduate student at Dallas Theological Seminary, and then I was getting ready to get married to my husband, Jerry, and I remember I moved into what would be our very first apartment. I moved into the apartment about a month or two before we got married. And I remember one of the very first things that I wanted to do was call the cable guy and get cable. It was like my aspiration in life to have cable, a whole hookup in my own house. And y'all, I feel a little bit old because this was back in the day when the television was a box. It wasn't flat. There was nothing flat about it. It was a whole box and it was inside of an armoire, a piece of furniture that you had to buy to put across from your bed. And so I remember the, the day, the glorious day, the cable guy came. And I remember him coming to the armoire, pushing the furniture out, getting some cables and some cords and hooking them up, the back of the television into the wall, getting everything situated. He put the furniture back and then he came around and he handed me the remote control. He said, let me make sure you know how this works. He said, push the guide button. I pushed the guide button, and I was wide-eyed in wonder at the amount of television watching and viewing opportunities were available. There were more channels than I knew what to do with flashing on the screen. I was mesmerized by all the television programs, all the, uh, the, the networks, all the things that were available to me. Now, the cable guy didn't make those magically appear. They had already always existed. The only reason I hadn't viewed them is because I didn't have the right hookup. They didn't just show up. It's that I hadn't been positioned to receive them. When you place faith in Jesus Christ and have relationship with him, you get the hookup. Ephesians chapter 1 says the hookup is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit takes up residence in you. And just in case you didn't know, the Holy Spirit is not a ghost or a wind or a fire or a dove. He's often symbolized by those things in the book, but y'all, that ain't who he is. He's the third person of the Trinity. And not third because he's least in value, just third because he's the last to be revealed to us in the pages of Scripture. But all of the fullness and all of the power and all of the glory and all of the grandeur of God the Father is in the person of the Holy Spirit. And when you place faith in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in you. You're not waiting on more of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a person. You can't give person in installments. Now you have to be filled by the influence of the Holy Spirit. And as you are, the Holy Spirit allows you to have the hookup. Your spiritual senses are heightened so that you can detect the presence, the word, the voice, the movement of God around you. As you yield to the little convictions of the Holy Spirit, you'll find that that conviction heightens as you become more and more sensitive to his leading in, his, in, in your life. You will be able to sense when he is giving you the red light of conviction. That means stop. Or the yellow light of a lack of peace that means wait. Or the green light of ease and confirmation that means go. And the more you and I yield to the hookup, the Holy Spirit, the more we will find his influence fervent in our lives. The Holy Spirit is the hookup and gives you and I the opportunity and the privilege to be able to hear the voice of God. And Jesus says, you need to have a relationship with me. And when you have a relationship with me, you are part of a family. And the family gives you opportunity to be able to hear the voice of your father. I remember sitting second row piano side at our church. My parents started the church that I still attend to this day about 47 years ago. Dad has pastored the same church for 47 years. Very faithful pastors and leaders and parents that I've had. And I remember sitting second row piano side. Uh, my mom would always sit there and, and I would most of the time the four of us would be sitting with her. But every now and then when it was time for the children's choir to sing, we'd be up in the children's choir uh, singing um, our little A and B selection. <laughs> And after we would sing, you know, then we had to sit through the rest of the service. 
So we do what kids do in church. We would, you know, pull out a little piece of gum or we'd be passing notes back and forth and, you know, kind of acting up up in the choir loft. And I remember that every now and then when I'd be doing the most up there, I would look down and catch my mother's eye. Ooh. Now, y'all know my mother didn't have to say anything to me because she had that mama eye. And with that one eye, a whole world of consequences unraveled. I mean, I heard the whole thing she was saying. Anybody have my mama? Y'all know what I'm talking about? She didn't have to say it all. Because we're part of the family, she could communicate to me easily. Okay? Ephesians chapter 2 verse 19 says this, that you once were outsiders. You once were exiles and migrants and aliens excluded from the rights of citizens. But when you come into relationship, you now share citizenship with the saints. You are God's own people, consecrated and set apart for himself. You belong to God's household and you are part of the family of God. You know how it is that you and your family have these little jokes and these little insights and these little nuances that even if you tried to explain to your friend why this is so funny to y'all, she still wouldn't get it. You'd tell her the, all the details, all the nuances, but because she's not part of the family, it doesn't hit the same, right? Well, Romans chapter 1 says that God is always revealing himself, meaning the fool says in his heart that there is no God. Because general revelation, Romans chapter 1, is that you shouldn't even be able to look at creation and not know there has got to be a God somewhere. It should be impossible. How in the world did those stars get in the sky? How in the world is the sun hanging in its, in its place? How in the world are there neighborhoods in the galaxies that scientists have not even yet discovered that are being orchestrated during the day and into the evening? How in the world is the moon where it's supposed to be? How is the earth rotating on its axis at just the right speed so that you and I can maintain life here? How in the world are all the nuances of the galaxies being sustained? How is the ocean being held back from the earth? Earth. The only way is if there's a God somewhere. General revelation is that God is always speaking to humankind, believers or not. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. But if you're like me, you're grateful for general revelation, but you want more than that. You want personal information. You want insight. You want what the old preachers used to call the illumination of the scriptures. That's where you're reading through a passage you've read a million times before. But on that day, it's like the Holy Spirit takes out a highlighter and causes it to leap up off the page and grip you. That's the best way I can explain it. It's a gripping in your soul where you know that that verse you've read before matters for you today. Where you know the Lord is giving you counsel on how to make that decision. On which internship to take. On which place to move to. On which relationship to pursue. And the one to turn your back on. On the direction to walk. On what associations to sever. On what to join. On what not to. That you feel the conviction of God's spirit through his word. I want, I want revelation like that, don't you? Because y'all, hearing God is less about newness. It's about now-ness. It's about an old word being made present tense for you right now. It's when the scriptures just leap up off the page and you know God is talking to you. Okay, you've had this happen because you've been sitting in chapel or in church before. And your pastor opens up the passage to preach. And you feel like you're the only person sitting in the room. You're trying to figure out, did the church bug my house? How did they know that this is exactly what I needed for what I'm facing? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Or like you're going to have your quiet time, spend a little time with the Lord maybe, and you open up to what just, you know, what you're reading that day, your devotional for that day, whatever devotional book maybe you're in that day, and you open it up. This happened to me yesterday. Opened it up, and my goodness, I just busted out laughing because it was like the Holy Spirit was saying, I know you, girl. I got you. I got you. <laughs> And see, sometimes when we're sitting in a setting like this and we feel that, like we know it's for us, or we feel convicted rather, a lot of times when we feel that warmth and that gripping and that conviction in our hearts, our tendency is to turn to the person next to us and say, girl, did you hear that? That's for you. You need to make sure you're listening to that. But when you feel conviction, that's because he's talking to you. 
it's for you. This is how the Holy Spirit speaks, and he speaks within the context of relationship. Jesus says, my sheep, there's the relationship, hear my voice. This is the result of your relationship. You hear his voice. The reason why I wanted to pause here for just a moment to emphasize the result of your relationship is because you need to know that is the default position of a child of God to hear his voice. It's not a special privilege. It is the privilege given to every son and daughter who has placed faith in Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is not given to some. He is given to all who place faith in Jesus Christ. So you and I don't have to have a certain degree before we can hear from God. We don't have to have been raised in a certain environment before we can hear from God. We all have to hone the discipline of hearing from God. But the privilege is already yours. And so the enemy is going to trip over himself to make you believe and me believe that that privilege and that right is for anybody and everybody else except us. But I assure you, the person who you most admire who I most admire because of the books maybe they've written that have fed us or the sermons they've preached that have um, taught us or the ministry that they have been entrusted with that have led us and given us guidance through the years. That person who you admire, the same Holy Spirit who lives in them is the same Holy Spirit that lives in you. So at the same time we thank the Lord for them, we can also sit on the edge of our seat in anticipation that the Holy Spirit of God desires to speak for us too. That we don't have to wait for the next devotional book before we come to the Word of God ourselves. And just sit with a couple of verses ourselves and say, Lord, my ears are open. As David said in Psalm chapter 119, he prayed and he said, Lord, would you open up my eyes so that today I can behold wonderful things in your law. So we pray that. Lord, open up my eyes. Sensitize my my heart. Make it so that I'm not indifferent and hardened and desensitized to when the Holy Spirit is speaking to me so that everything you've come to say And that I have the privilege of here to hear that I don't miss any of that. Because just like you have five physical senses with which you detect the things that are physical and visible, you touch them, you smell them, you taste them. There are spiritual senses that you have the capacity to detect. The Holy Spirit heightens your spiritual radar so that you can pick up on the presence of God around you. In other words, what other people will say is coincidence, you'll go, that ain't coincidence. That's God right there. Other people will think they're lucky stars, and you'll be like, I don't know what them stars doing up there, but I know that my God is sovereign and providential. (laughs) That I know he's working all things together for my good. So some people will see it as just coincidence and you'll be able to say, no, 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 that was God putting me in the right place at the right time with the right person on the right day and giving me the right opportunity. God was lining that up. You'll be able to detect that the stranger behind you who tripped a little bit and spilled that coffee on you, that that was not a little mistake that you're supposed to be annoyed about, that that's an opportunity for you to be the hands and feet of Jesus, for you to minister to this person. Other people will say it's an interruption. You'll be able to say, "Uh uh-uh, that's divine intervention. That's God putting me where I need to be to be who he has called me to be. The result of your relationship, y'all, expect it. Lean forward in anticipation every single day with your spiritual senses heightened. Holy Spirit, as I go throughout this day, I'm asking you to show me where you're moving. Let me hear when you're speaking. Let me see when you're lining stuff up, when you're doing things that other folks won't even detect. But if I'll just keep my spiritual radar raised, I know you'll open my eyes and open my ears to hear your voice. My sheep, there's the relationship. Hear my voice, there's the result. And then he says, here's the reason. I know them. He says, that's the reason all this works is because I know my sheep. Now, I called up a friend of mine who uh, works with sheep and cattle. Because I don't know if y'all can tell by looking at me or not, but I'm not really a sheep and cattle kind of sister. So I looked, I I called up a friend who works with sheep and cattle. I asked him about this whole idea of the shepherd knowing the sheep. 
And he said, you know what, Priscilla, it's really interesting. It used to be that way. It used to be that you needed to know your sheep. But you know, technology has advanced. We don't know our sheep anymore. We don't have to. We have electric fences and sheep dogs and we can brand them and we can put collars on them. We can do the things we need to do and get them to go where we want them to go without having a relationship. But they said in Jesus' day, all 100 knew the shepherd because they walked with him and they talked with him and they were in, in relationship with him. They followed him. They knew his scent. They knew his stature. They were able to be completely aware one shepherd to the other because they were with him continually. In fact, they were so intimate with each other that when the shepherd would call out to the sheep, he knew them so specifically and they knew his voice so personally because they spent so much time with him that he could shift the tone of his call just a little bit and call one sheep out of the fold. That's how well they knew each other. But modern technology has changed the need for shepherds and sheep to get to know each other like that. And while modern technology has not changed the Lord's desire to get to know you, if you're not careful and if I'm not, it'll change our desire to get to know him. Because we'll just be too busy for that. So if you're not careful, brothers and sisters, ministry for you will become a business. It'll be an enterprise. It'll be an industry. And you will forget quicker than you can even imagine that it was always designed to be a relationship where the sheep and the shepherd are walking beside each other to green pastures and to still waters, that there is a rapport, that you're constantly cultivating a relationship. You're supposed to get to know him. And he, trust me, already knows you. He knows where you've been. He knows what you've done. He knows what you've said. He knows what you're thinking right this minute. He knows us inside and out, which means that he knows how to make sure you can hear him. He knows what he needs to do if you're stubborn like me and he has to say it three times. He knows you. He knows what he has to do to make sure your eyes are open so that you can see. He desires for you to hear his voice. So there's nothing you can do or say to work yourself out of the grace and the mercy of God that will come find you wherever you are to make sure that you have opportunity to continually hear the voice of God in different seasons of your life. He knows you like that. And I can't believe that the God of the universe knows me like for real, for real and still calls me his friend. I can't believe it, but I'm so grateful. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and here's the response. They follow me. Y'all, this is what the sheep do. They follow. They don't negotiate. They don't ignore. They don't try to figure out a plan B in case A doesn't work out. They just plain old flat out follow. Why? Because they believe they have a good shepherd. That's why. In fact, Hebrews chapter 13 says he ain't just good. Your father is a great shepherd. And if the pasture you're in right now is pretty doggone green and you're pretty satisfied where you are, but you feel the shepherd calling you to a different place or a different position or a different posture, then you can believe that if he's taking you from this pasture, there are greener pastures in the next place that he's taking you to. There's refreshing still water for you there. The question is, will you and I trust that if the shepherd's calling, then he knows the plans that he has for us plans to give us a hope, plans to give us a future, not to fail us, not to harm us, not to hurt us. He will never leave us nor forsake us. If he's calling you, the best response you can ever have is to say, yes, sir, and follow. I want you to bow your heads because I want to ask you a question, two of them. The first thing I do have to ask you is about that whole relationship business, y'all. Because I do not want to take for granted that just because you are here, you've just anchored in your soul. Like you know, know that you have placed faith in Jesus Christ. I'm not going to take that for granted today. 
so I need you to, to ponder that for a moment. I'm not asking if you've been in church. I'm not asking if you've done a whole bunch of good stuff, ministry activity. I'm asking you, have you placed faith in Jesus Christ and solidified your relationship with him so that the Holy Spirit of God can take up residence in you and you can have the hookup and hear from God? And the second question I have for you is to consider whether or not there is something that you know the Lord is convicting and challenging you to do right now in your life, but you are not following him. You've been negotiating. You've been maybe ignoring. You've been hoping he'll stop talking to you about it and call somebody else. But you know it's you and you've delayed obedience. But there is no such thing as delayed obedience. Delayed obedience is disobedience. And so if you fall into either of those two categories, you need to place faith in Jesus Christ today or you need to return back to obedience in some area of your life where you know he is calling and you have not followed. If you fall into either of those two categories, would you just raise your hand right where you are so we can pray together? Yes, anybody else? Lord Jesus, I pray for my brothers and sisters here, particularly those who have their hands raised. And I ask right now in the name of Jesus Christ that you would do a supernatural work in their hearts and lives. First of all, for any who need to be drawn in salvation, the fact they've raised their hand means they already know that you're calling them. Thank you for the hound of heaven that will not let us go. So I thank you that you say that if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, we shall be saved. So even now in the quietness of your heart, if that's something you need to pray, just say, Lord, I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. And I believe you are that Savior. And so today I place faith in you to remove my sins. Take up residence in me in the person of the Holy Spirit right now in Jesus' name. And then, Lord, for those who need to yield to you and to follow you in obedience, I thank you that they have, that we have, Lord, raised our hand in admission. And so I pray, Lord, that you would give us the courage to repent and go a different way. I thank you, Father, that you are giving us the grace and the mercy in this moment to follow you fully and completely. And so, Lord, help us to turn, help us to honor you. And I pray for every single one who has raised their, their hand, that by your spirit, you would cloak them with a supernatural level of courage to do exactly what it is that you've called them to do. I pray that you would quiet the voice of the enemy, any distraction, any discouragement that he has blanketed over their lives, and that you would replace it with an encouragement to follow you. And then, Lord, when they do, I pray that you would help them to experience victory and freedom like they have never experienced before. And when you do it, we will be careful to give you all the praise and all the honor and all the glory because you are indeed worthy. In Jesus' name, everybody agreed and said amen. 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 It almost doesn't even feel right to come up after Priscilla. Come on, help me honor one more time. Priscilla and Jerry, thank you. What I, what I love about you and even this moment is we can look at someone like Priscilla and think, man, she's just so gifted, and you are. But this is hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and years after year after year spending time with the Lord. That was a command of scripture that didn't come from sermons. That came from her time with the Lord. So I want to thank you and I honor you and your family. Thank you, Mr. Jerry, for being here as well. We love you and your sons. And if you ever want to change churches, come on over. We would love to, we would love to have you. But uh, aren't you thankful for the people that come, for Priscilla and her family? Thank you. And this is just a Thursday at chapel. That's, that's just wild to me. Um, we Thank you. Aren't y'all excited for the women's conference? No one, we just got taste. It's going to be incredible. Um, that's all the announcement that I have for you guys. So, ladies, if you have not yet registered for the conference, make sure that you're, you've done that. Um, it's going to be powerful. And today, students, y'all know y'all go to the food hall for lunch and Discovery Day guests. We have food prepared for you in the lobby. Have the best 
most blessed day. We'll see you out there. Have a great day.